um, your host today at the eLiterate Standard of Proof uh, webinar series. Uh, we normally broadcast uh, from the historic Muppet Theater, uh, but today we're lucky enough uh, to have some guest help here from uh, the great technical crew at Macmillan, uh, who also happens to be um, our special guests for this uh, this webinar. Um, so eLiterate uh, readers, welcome, and uh, Macmillan customers uh, and general Macmillan fans, welcome. Uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about the eLiterate Standard of Proof webinars series. Uh, we highlight um, projects, contributions really, uh, made by vendors that help advance the our general state of knowledge about um, improving student success um, in the sector. So it, not enough to just for a vendor to be helping their own customers, they have to be helping everyone regardless of whether they are customers. Uh, and they have to be doing so in some meaningful collaboration with academics. So the title standard of proof refers both to the desire to see some empirical um, evidence that the contribution is having an impact on on student success um, as well as a measure of the the quality of vendors we believe at eliterate that vendors should be judged in part on their contribution to the sector since education is special um, so i'm delighted to be here um, with mcmillan today um, we're going to be um, hearing about their um, research framework uh, from Kara McWilliams, a Vice President of Learning Science at Macmillan. Um, and we're also joined uh, by two of their academic partners, uh, Thanos Patelis, who you'll, you'll find out actually wears several different hats, but I'm going to introduce him as Senior Lecturer uh, at Fordham University. Um, and also a fellow member of Macmillan's uh, Impact Research Advisory Council with me. So I've been very lucky to observe uh, Macmillan's work uh, on student impact up close. Uh, and Selena Lindahl, uh, Senior Lecturer at Cal Poly State University. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, today's webinar has a resonance that I didn't actually uh, expect, I'm not sure that anyone could have anticipated, um, as we face down uh, this new coronavirus outbreak. I hope you all are safe uh, at home and that your loved ones are safe and your students and colleagues are safe. Um, but one of the remarkable aspects of what we're experiencing right now is the breathtaking pace at which the science has unfolded. And I follow this all very closely. So what I'm seeing is a lot of pre-publication research that has not yet been peer reviewed, published outside pay uh, walls, pre-peer review, uh, because we face an urgent challenge. Um, and this is very early research based on limited sample data. And so we're experiencing in real time what it's like to um, try to make sense out of science as it unfolds based on early data uh, for a really consequential um, topic. Um, and I would argue that we've had that situation for a long time in a variety of areas in our lives. We just haven't been aware of it. And education happens to be one of them. Um, so today I'm, I'm delighted that we're going to be um, talking a little bit about um, applying data and, and uh, an empiric sense of empiricism to our work in improving student success um, and how we can communicate about it better, um, especially in the early stages as we're just beginning to get information and beginning to learn and how we share what we know as soon as we know it without giving people a false sense uh, that we know more or less than we actually do. So um, I'd like to start this conversation actually uh, with uh, you, Selena. Now, you've participated um, in, um, in Macmillan's uh, early research. Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the product 
that you uh, helped um, evaluate and um, why you got involved and why you think it's important as a faculty member to take on that sort of work? Oh, I think you're muted, Selena. <laughs> Can how about you try now? Nope. Oh, oh, there we uh, go. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, my name is Selena Lindahl. I've uh, I've been teaching since 1995, so um, I feel like I sort of came of age in the era where things were happening happening pretty rapidly. So you know that this PowerPoint. We, we we started with blackboards, and um, <laughs> ironically, we ended up on a platform called Blackboard. Um, completely different, right? Um, but but um, you know, all, all along the way, we're sort of seeing such rapid change, and so it afforded me this this perspective of um, being less uh, vested in any one technology. So I've sort of just been serially trying new technologies because i it it just made sense and there's such all these new technologies hold such promise um and i'm pr a pretty optimistic person that i you know just keep dabbling in them um and so i guess for that reason i'm you know i i'm always game to try uh the, the next big thing and i i've been you know i've used pretty much everything out there and uh the the thing that I'm testing that that I'm beta testing and giving feedback for is is Macmillan's product called Achieve, and it um uh it does what you know what some of the many of the platforms are doing these days um, really is using learning science in an interesting way and and because of my role with the Chancellor's Office and uh, with my Center for Teaching and Learning on campus where we sort of focus on best practices and try to you know, in all of all of our instructor spare time, uh, when we're not researching or doing other things, it's you know we're expecting to, we're we're hoping that faculty are interested in in learning science as well. So the scholarship of teaching and learning is um, is always been super important to me, and I, I feel like um, when publishers take it seriously, that draws me in quite a bit and um, achieve does this thing where it labels not just for faculty like what the learning path is and it sort of abides by what we know about learning science but it also labels it for students which um keeps me coming back i just feel like yeah let's see how that plays out for students when they actually get to see how how learning works for them it's not at all what they you know what they have come up under so um, i guess that that's somewhat how I got involved. I've been writing PowerPoints and doing other sort of ancillary work for for publishers for a long time. So I'm a natural, I guess, sort of serial experimenter. So I, I, does that answer your question? I think I came on board for some of those reasons. Oh, now Michael, you're muted. Lots of buttons to push on this platform. There you go. <laughs> So yes, it it does answer um, the question, Selena. I appreciate that. I'd like to to drill down just a little bit more. We will talk about achieve um, in more detail when when Carrie um, um, digs into um, the details of of the research itself. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more before we um, uh, move on to Thanos, um, Selena, about um, your calling because when we spoke the last time you talked a little bit about your sense of obligation um mm -hmm. in doing this work why do you think it's important for faculty for for teaching faculty to be engaged in not only trying new things but uh but the kind of collaborative research that you're working on with mcmillan right now well i mean to me it's it's such a I don't want to use this word lightly, but it's such a precious um, endeavor that we're in, that we're involved in as instructors in every facet of the educational system. That, um, frankly, I'm I get really um, 
get really frustrated with instructors that don't take this the teaching portion seriously and so I, I do feel um, I feel like it's an obligation for those of us that are on the side of paying attention to it um, to to reach out to others because I, I don't want to make a you know a coronavirus parallel here that doesn't need to happen but the sort of like sharing with two or three instructors each that teach 500 students is is massive shift and i feel as if it's difficult for so i i think most of us would agree to that but where do we find the resources to do that and that's where i appreciate when somebody else who has the resources like a publisher can get involved and say all right we're going to take seriously the work of experimentation and figuring out what works and what doesn't rather than just selling us um, the you know x the the user interview of someone that's only used one product and can say yeah i guess it worked pretty well um you know doing some more serious research than that 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 to me feels like something that's that has larger use than just making money for the publisher for sure great agreed um so thanos um uh you are you and i have have spent some time together um, looking at the work in progress that we're now seeing the the, the output from today. Um, and uh, your background, you've you've uh, asked to be introduced as a lecturer, but you you are a professional evaluator of research uh, in this field. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about both the background that you bring um, to this? work um as well as why you from your perspective uh, as an educational researcher um you are interested in this kind of uh collaboration sure and yeah i have um currently i'm a senior lecturer at, at fordham as you nicely introduced me but the I've been and I've been teaching since 1987 at uh, graduate and undergraduate levels, mostly methods-based courses and uh, substantive courses in psychology. Uh, so I love teaching and uh, the uh, undertaking of learning and helping others learn material that improves, uh, helps them achieve their goals in terms of a career and getting a degree and things like that. So um, I'm very passionate about supporting the learning of, uh, process for um, adults, but also do, doing some work in supporting that for uh, uh, K to 12. So I, uh, I consider education and learning quite important and fundamental to our developing and growing as individuals. And, uh, but uh, my training and practical experience has been in two fields, right? The program evaluation assessment field that we're sort of been engaged in, participate in ensuring that the goals of a program are met and we're evaluating and using rigorous methods to um, help improve and provide information about an initiative or a product, a tech product. So I've been doing that for a while, so really since 1990, um, both in a K to 12 environment and higher ed um, settings. And then the other area has been my training in um, as a psychometrician or a measurement expert, building and maintaining the quality of instruments. And you kind of need that in order to have, you know, good science represents having good tools, good instruments. <laughs> and if we want to achieve our goals of ensuring that certain things are working, we want to make sure that the instrumentation we use are solid, uh, truth, provide truthful and uh, reliable information. So since 90 as well, I've been involved in developing these instruments and uh, um, both for large scale and national use uh, and also for more local regional use. And, and really, those are the means for um, uh, uh, the, the, the sound methods for gathering information to evaluate the a program that include using sound measures those kind of the two factors that um, i've been involved in for two and a half decades or so uh, in in doing um, that really are the means for fueling my <laughs> passion my interest 
uh, in supporting the learning experience of, uh, of people. So the driver, as you asked, uh, what's driving me to be involved is ensuring that whatever we expose folks to is working. Uh, and we need to do that through um, sound methodology, sound measurements, uh, so that we can draw some good conclusions and valid conclusions about what's happening to the folks that we're working with. Okay, so what we have here is a um, we have two passionate educators um, who have both in their their own way um, gotten involved on, in different ways and uh, um, in in the research. And Thanos is somebody who is um, who's field is educational research um, uh, and uh, has to communicate the subtleties of that to your colleagues and are passionate about communicating that to your teaching colleagues. Um, what is hard about that, um, which is relevant to the challenge that Macmillan is taking on of communicating to its customers about what they know and don't know about a product uh, in its particularly in its early stages of development. Why is why is that a hard thing to do? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and hard translates to uh, time and money <laughs> when we're talking <laughs> about the uh, about this. And and the, these uh, the the reasons that it, it makes it hard is that um, first you need to engage um, if you are an evaluator or researcher you want to understand the learning process and whether folks are learning and how they're learning and whether the, the, the intervention that you're doing, the instructional program that you're introducing is actually working. The, the, the first thing that makes it hard is you need to engage the busy folks who are doing the work. Um, and so uh, the faculty, the teachers, the students, uh, the, it's hard to engage folks when they're focused in on so many fa so many things in their lives. So that's all that makes it hard. And the reason you want to engage them is because you want to make sure you're getting the information um, clearly uh, in the most uh, uh, unbiased way possible and most authentic uh, uh, way possible, so that you can really truly understand that. So and the, this engagement is really hard. Uh, I mean, how many uh, marketers have you hung up on uh, or researchers uh, trying to understand who's going to, who are you going to vote for? Have you hung up on because you just don't have time? <laughs> and so uh, trying to engage folks uh, to, to, to uh, get that in uh, is hard. The, the second thing is because you're trying to um, not base your conclusions on anecdote, on just superficial happenstance of events or luck. Um, you're trying to collect data and information in, in um, very precise, specific ways that involves a lot of time and effort. Um, and in a, sort of the tradition of this empirical scientific approach, we need to collect data not only and information not only of those that are engaged in uh, the program that we're trying to evaluate, but also a comparison uh, group of individuals who are not or using some kind of control method, almost like what the FDA is kind of doing now and uh, trying to find that, uh, since you brought it up, the cure for uh, the coronavirus, uh, that, um, that injection that will make us uh, uh, immune to it or uh, help improve our well-being. They're trying to do that in a scientifically way, and that involves a lot of time and effort to ensure that the way the uh, intervention is introduced, the data that is collected is the highest quality and truthful, and that it involves clinical trials, if you will, um, that take a lot of time and effort to convince uh, those to engage in it and also to collect that data. So it's it's uh, time consuming uh, and, and it makes it hard. Um, All right, so so that's uh, Kara Thanos has laid out two pretty daunting challenges, <laughs> uh, which we'll tackle in reverse order. Right, the first one he brought up was, gee, it, it's really hard just to convey anything with nuance compactly to folks who are busy 
trying to get on with their day, serve their students, um, feed their families, get through whatever the crisis of the day happens to be. Um, and then second of all, it's, it's hard to actually get that nuance. And those two things interact with each other, I think, because we don't, um, a lot of uh, very sophisticated um, educational practitioners who I would call empirical, by which I mean that they try things, they look for evidence about whether those things are actually helping their students and they adjust accordingly. They don't naturally um, think of their work in the classroom as um, evidence driven necessarily, uh, even when they're teaching science courses and that's their discipline. So let's talk a little bit, uh, Kara, if you don't mind, about um, how Macmillan uh, communicates um, in general and thinks about in general communicating our le level of understanding and certainty about anything that we're trying to understand better in this field. Sure, and um, Danos and Selena both brought up really great points. I think that at Macmillan, when we started to think about these challenges, there were sort of two things that we always thought about. When we talk about efficacy in the field, typically um, efficacy claims are made in one of two ways. One has been sort of what Selena was saying, word of mouth by instructors, um, colleagues in the department saying, I think this works, it worked for my students. And so there would be this word of mouth that wasn't really based on any um, sound evidence or reliable or valid claims like Thanos was talking about. And the second way was through these summative statements of impact. And so, you know, three or five years after a product was in the market, a really um, rigorous randomized control trial would come out and a claim would be made about half a letter grade improvement or a full letter grade improvement. And those would be sort of the rigorous claims of impact. And there were problems with both of those approaches, but specifically on the efficacy side, the first, Michael, as you alluded to, we would get um, educators information much too late to make sort of adoption and implementation decisions in their courses. Um, we had already led to false starts and frustrations because there was no real data-driven evidence until they had already decided to start using it. The second, to Thanos's point, is a lot of these studies are conducted in one educational context with one instructor because it's difficult to engage instructors and to engage a representative sample of instructors who all have a lot on their plate. And it's difficult to say, okay, yes, I'm gonna pause now and I'm going to participate in a research study with you. But fortunately, there are so many instructors out there like Selena who are so who want to be so evidence driven and they wanna to contribute to the field that they're now willing to participate more in these types of studies. The challenge, though, is that those aren't the only educators that we want participating in our studies. We want a nice, full representative sample. So that was one of the challenges that we needed to overcome. But um, you know, we have really great partners who have worked with us. And then the last thing is that, you know, again, to Thanos's point, the student is so important in this case. For so long, we have just sort of lumped all of the students in a class together and made claims about the impact on those students rather than really taking the time to go through the appropriate IRB approvals and to get the active informed consents from all of the students and collect the information that we need on those students so that we can disaggregate them into subgroups and understand what I like to refer to as the differential efficacy of a tool to see if the magnitude of the relationship between use and outcomes is different for different groups of students. So in thinking about all of those things, um, Macmillan Learning worked with Thanos and Michael and the other folks on the Impact Research Advisory Council and worked with the partner instructors that we engage with for research and we developed a framework for how we believe that um, educational technology can be evaluated to understand um, if it's working, who it works for, and in what context. And if it's okay, I'd like to just share that um, on the screen now, Michael. Please. So just let me know if you can see that framework. It's showing for me. Great. So what you're looking at here is the framework that Macmillan Learning adopted with the um, support of the impact research, our academic experts and our partner instructors. What we hope that this framework enables for the field is, you know, it's not specific to Macmillan Learning's tools. It's specific to any type of educational technology. So this framework can be used by any vendor who is developing a digital learning tool to help sort of set the framework for the evidence that they want to collect starting in development all the way through when the tool is in market. 
but it can also be used by administrators or educators or parents or students or anyone who's thinking about adopting a digital learning tool. They can look at this framework and understand whether the vendor that they're evaluating or the tool that they're evaluating has each of these pieces of evidence or the pieces of evidence that matter the most to them. In some cases, educators care more about one of these verticals than another one. And we wanted to make sure that they were individual enough that folks could look at the information that mattered the most to them and um, understand the claims that could be made. So I'll just quickly walk through sort of how we think about this framework. Mm -hmm. When we start early in a tool's development, it's important to understand whether the tool is built on learning science principles. And the publisher or the vendor or the provider needs to make that information available to the general public. And not just say, here are a list of citations that we looked at to understand the research before we built the tool. It's important to be able to say, um, like the example Selena gave, where Macmillan Learning has pre, in, or in post class. You know, we have an active learning model that we share, um, that we publish under Creative Commons, and we share to help folks understand the learning science beneath our products. And then secondly, was the tool developed in partnership with instructors and students? You know, vendors and product developers can be so far removed from the classroom that unless we really partner, you know, in the same rooms, conducting workshops with instructors and with their students and with a representative sample of both, that's how you really, um, you know, develop the, uh, the empathy for the end user of the tool. And that's how you really apply human-centered design to a product's development. So that partnership at the early stages is really important. As we move to later stage development and optimization, we think it's really important that implementation patterns are researched and documented. As educational technology becomes more comprehensive and can be used in so many different ways, one of the key tenets of an effective tool is that it's flexible enough to um, enhance an instructor's pedagogy, whatever that might be. And so we wanna make sure that we understand how educators are using those tools because those use cases are gonna be heavily related to the outcomes. And in addition to that, those implementation patterns can help us support teaching and learning because we might say to an educator, well, look at all of this research that was done in this implementation pattern in an educational context like yours. You might try implementing um, these different features or these different capabilities. And we wouldn't be able to have that impact on teaching and learning if we didn't look at those implementation patterns. Then as I said, we wanna make sure that effectiveness is measured within context and student cohort. One of my favorite stories from my early days of researching educational technology is when I was talking to an instructor and I said, you know, you should really try to use the tool this way, look at this great research study that was conducted and these great outcomes. And she said to me, um, you know, I teach at a two year open enrollment institution and this research was done at a highly selective, small four year institution. And while the research is rigorous, it doesn't really apply to my students or to my educational context. And she couldn't have been more right. So we think it's important to capture that information about the educational context, partner with instructors across those different contexts, capture the data needed to look at different student cohorts and look at evidence within those different groups. Then, um, especially when you're thinking about tools that are early in development, once a tool has been optimized based on the feedback that you've gotten in those early studies, you wanna replicate those results. Because early stage, it's likely that the educators that are partnering with you might be more tolerant to technology, might be more open to different, you know, to ch changes in their classroom or doing things a different way. You want to try to expand that sample so that it's replicated among um, a more generalizable population, all types of instructors, all types of students, um, to understand if there are any differences. And then finally, once you understand how a tool is being used, once you have that evidence of effectiveness or correlational evidence within context, within cohort, like Thanos said, it's incredibly important that you then can make valid causal claims of impact, where you're actually comparing use of the tool with non-use of the tool and something else. And when you have those causal claims, it's important to look at those um, outcomes within implementation model so that you're able to look back to the early research you did and say, when a tool is used this way, these are the claims of impact that we can have. 
so that's a really um, high level view, Michael, at the framework that we have developed in partnership with our um, experts and our instructors that help us understand the evidence that we think will help administrators and educators make decisions. And as I said, we hope that this framework will be used more broadly and not just for McMillan's tools, though hopefully later in the hour we'll be able to show you how we've applied it um, to achieve. Thank you, Kara. So, so I really want to emphasize um, that this approach is a contribution, right? As, as Kara was just saying, you can use it with any researching any product. Um, and so um, what we're going to see in the second half of the hour is the application of that contribution to Macmillan's own work um, and um, how that hopefully for you and for uh for the market um increases your confidence that the product that you're getting is well designed is well tested both keeping both the um uh, what we know in general about science in mind as well as um what we know about you and your teaching circumstances and your students in mind so let me before we move on to that though Kara. I want to turn back to to Thanos and 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 Selena uh, first. Thanos, as as um um a researcher practitioner um, who's interested in in communicating um, what you know about uh, the efficacy of a product uh, to your colleagues. Um, how does this framework resonate with you? Um. The, the framework is uh, fundamental to the to the evaluation process to uh, the the process of evaluating it with sound evidence um, the manner in which it's communicated is was uh, obviously clearly done by Kara um, as a proponent uh, as sort of a contributor to I mean because of her expertise and uh, wisdom uh, she was able to introduce this to Macmillan Learning, <laughs> uh, which is also, as you indicated, a contribution to the field. Um, but it is fundamental, right, to the uh, how a program evaluation uh, uh, happens. But what, uh, unfortunately, in many e evaluation efforts, small and large scales, the nuance of what this process represents is lost. Uh, in fact, um, the U.S. Department of Education has invested a huge amount of resources for providing a clearinghouse of uh, scientifically based efficacy studies, most of it in the K-12 area, in, in what's called the What Works Clearinghouse. And what they found is not many people use it. Um, and when they did some inquiry as to, well, why aren't people using it? It's free, it's out there. Uh, and there are really two fundamental reasons. And the primary reason is that um, people aren't, uh, the information conveyed is not accessible um, in a user-friendly manner that really resonates with, well, I just wanna do the right thing. And you're not, and I'm not understanding the nuances and the, uh, technology of the, or the terminology used for me to uh, use it in my practice. And so there's now a, a turned uh, the new uh, uh, director of the IES uh, program. I've heard him speak at a number of different location uh, uh, places indicating that they're investing funds to translate the results of that information to something that is usable in, in the field. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, what you heard from Kara is atypical <laughs> of what the field has done in terms of the clarity of the communication of the of the framework and, and the process that uh, one goes through in collecting this uh, um, um, evidence. So uh, I don't know if that's uh, oh, what you were asking me to uh, elaborate on, but it is. Uh, um, uh, it falls short, unfortunately, in 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 in, in, the, in in the mainstream. No, spot on. What 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 the essence of what I just heard from you is that 
communicating clearly about what we know and how we know it um, has an enormous impact on whether on the degree to which effective practices get looked at, never mind adopted. Um, so Selena, um, as a as a you know practitioner uh, who uh, you know is an expert in in your discipline and um, you know a believer in um, um, in learning about more effective teaching and want an evangelist to your colleague, uh, how does this framework scan to you? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. I would echo Thanos and say that it's it's pretty fundamental. I happen to be part of a discipline that's, I don't think this is true everywhere, but we're fair, economists are fairly cynical, fairly, um, you know, doing a lot of our own research. So anything that looks less than uh, peer reviewed, well designed research is going to be sort of just um, uh, forgotten about or not even paid attention to in the first place. So, um, so for me, this this is approaching the sort of respectability that um, I think the the more old school instructors sometimes um, find it easy to um, to not work on their teaching. Let's just say because a but what you mentioned already, Thanos, was about sort of the 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 language barrier, right? Of not even understanding what a flipped classroom is or what what the different forms of active learning or low stakes, high stakes, summative, formative assessment. These are sort of like, you know, barriers. So building a bridge to understand that and, and sort of um, help us to make sense, help us that have never had any training in teaching and learning, don't know much about the learning science, help us to come to grips with it is, is invaluable. And I find that the framework for me and for what I believe my colleagues might be uh, dragging their feet about it does a lot of work to sort of breaking to, to, to building a bridge and breaking down um, both the um, the the negative interpretation of of you know any publisher and any publisher research or research about teaching and learning in general um, it, it raises the respectability but then it also does the work which I think is maybe even more important which is just um, tagging things like um, um, giving a layperson's sort of perspective on on education, so that so that the language barrier is is in decline, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there are probably a number of items that Kara listed off casually um, in in terms of things that Macmillan has to think about that most educators weren't aren't aware of as, as issues for curricular materials designers. Um, but then once you hear them, they make sense. It's not that this mm -hmm. is beyond the capacity of the average PhD uh, to understand. It's just that we haven't, we haven't framed it uh, for them in a way that is accessible to them in the time they have and the framework that they have and so on and so forth. Right. So so yeah so Kara we we spend a lot of time on the on the setup of this uh, you know high percentage of our of our hour together um, because I think it's really important for folks to understand um, that um, there's a certain if a tree falls in the forest kind of aspect about educational research um, and um, now that we've talked through how you approach this framework and why, how you use it, not only to make sure that you're touching all the bases internally in terms of being doing responsible research. There are a whole bunch of topics that we're not going to get to today that maybe we'll do in a follow-up webinar at some point, such as IRB um, communication, that is um, working with academic um, bodies that oversee human subjects research. Because when you're you're researching uh, for those of you who are not involved in educational research, when you are researching uh, a product uh, that impacts your students' learnings, you are in fact doing human subjects research, um, and that in an academic institution falls under some of the same um, guidelines and, and review requirements inter-institutionally as, say, 
you know, a study of a cardiac intervention or a psychological intervention. Um, so lots and lots to talk about, right? This is what we what we're given is a way in, and and, um, and now Kara, what I'd like to do is move a little bit faster um, uh, now that we have this set up and give you an opportunity to really dig into the case study that is Achieve and talk a little bit, give us just a a, a, um, a, a high level overview of what Achieve is, and then dive into how your research went and, and what you all did and, and how that project is going for you. Sure. So I'll just share my screen again. Um, so to give a really brief background on Achieve, Achieve is a next generation learning platform that is um, developed what we call for the whole student, where it is um, in a tool that offers pre-class activities, in-class activities to increase um, active learning and engagement, and post-class activities. It includes um, an assessment system, so it's not just a homework system. Um, we really think it's important to have cognitive and non-cognitive assessments that enable insights for instructors through dashboard reports. Um, and so really Achieve is meant to support the whole student. In I, order to, oh, um, sorry, go ahead. No, I apologize for interrupting. I just realized I should have said much earlier in the webinar. Please, um, uh, attendees, if you have some questions for any of the panelists, uh, please put them in the chat window. Um, and we're as we get into the meat of Kara's presentation, I said suspect you will have some questions. So please go 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 right ahead and ask. Sorry, please continue, Kara. No worries. So in order to evaluate um, such a comprehensive tool like Achieve, it's really important for us to implement that framework that we went over. What you can see here is how we have applied the framework, um, the efficacy framework to Achieve. What we're trying to communicate here are a couple of things. One, like we've been talking about, that we conduct rigorous research that meets the standards of the type of study that we're conducting at that time. Two, that the claims that we can make are appropriate based on the evidence we have given the data that we've collected at that time. And then thirdly, we want to communicate it in a way that is easily consumable and it's practical and actionable and, and there is an increased utility in the research. It doesn't just sit on a shelf somewhere. It can really be used for adoption and implementation decisions. We also, um, on top of all of that, we want to be really transparent. And I welcome you to look at a recent Inside Higher Ed article that was written on our approach to efficacy, where the author really focused on this idea of transparency. We don't just publish the positive results of our tools. We publish all of the results of our tools. Um, and we know that by being transparent and pulling the curtain back early in testing, some of the results aren't going to be as positive as we want them to be, but we think it's all part of building that trust between the vendors and the educators and the administrators who are going to be using these tools. So what you can see here is how we've placed a red dot next to each of the pieces of evidence that we have collected for Achieve. And we have claims that we can confidently make on e about each of those pieces of evidence. You'll see that there are some white dots. That's because we are currently in our last semester of beta testing, and in this semester is when we're conducting that quasi-experimental trial or that comparison group. So we can't yet make those claims that are in white, but we hope to be able to make them at the end of the semester. Again, what this means to do is for an instructor to go to our website and look across our framework and see the information that's important to them and understand what we can say now, what we hope to be able to say, and when we hope to be able to say it. On the website, each of the headings on these columns are clickable. So if an educator or an administrator is really interested in implementation patterns or how we have evaluated implementation patterns or how instructors are using our tools, they can click on that header and it will bring them directly to the report where the evidence is aligned to the information that's inside of that column. Again, we're trying to make it really easy for um, educators or parents or students or anyone who's interested to be able to access that information in a consumable way. So just to give you some examples of what we've been looking at, um, all the way on the left-hand side here, you see that in the summer of 2017 through the fall of 2018, our learning research team spent a great deal of time working with um, product developers and engineers and educators and students to create the learning model and the learning science principles that would underpin Achieve. 
as I said, we've published all of them under Creative Commons, so they're um, all publicly available, both for um, you know educators to understand how Achieve is being used, but also so that the field can benefit, like we hope it benefits from this framework. We want it to be used more broadly. We also engaged with hundreds of students and hundreds of instructors to sort of understand the personas behind the folks who would be using our tools to make sure that we were designing a tool that would support all students and the whole student. And I think the work that we have done there um, has recently been recognized. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar, but Digital Promise recently created a research-based design product certification where the tool and all of the publicly available information about the learning science that's built into the tool is goes through a rigorous external evaluation by the Digital Promise team, and they evaluate whether there is the evidence that the tool is built on the learning science principles, and the Achieve tool recently received that recognition from Digital Promise, which is just another piece of evidence to help you know, educators understand this is a tool that we expect will work for their students. Then, when we moved into spring of 2019, we partnered with 60 instructors and their students. Um, during that time, um, Thanos made a really good point that it's difficult to create the instruments and collect the data that you need to be able to make the claims that you're hoping to make. And so we had a really rigorous longitudinal data collection process, which Selena, I'm sure, can speak to um, because she's gone through it a number of times. But we collect baseline surveys from instructors and students after um, students have actively informed consent to give us information about their background, demographic, experience with digital technology, experience in education. We collect implementation logs from instructors. So every week we ask them to do sort of a diary study to help us understand how they used Achieve that week, why they used it that way. We, the researchers visit the campuses and sit in on the classrooms and they observe Achieve being used. They um, conduct focus groups with students, on-site interviews with instructors. At the end of the semester, we collect um, post surveys that we match to the baseline surveys. We also extract the platform data to understand empirical implementation and usage patterns. And for consenting students, instructors share their classroom records with us. So their participation grades, their, attend, um, their engagement grades, their um, final course grades, their exam grades, any grade that an instructor has collected, they share with us. So we can match all of those data together and have a more comprehensive view of how instructors have used the tools, how students have engaged, and the outcomes they have received. We look at the relationship between use and outcome within implementation pattern. You can see the correlation on top of the chart, but then we also are able to do things like disaggregate the data between students more and less academically prepared to succeed. So we can understand if it's only sort of the much more academically prepared students who are benefiting from this tool um, and to understand you know, if we're keeping them challenged and also supporting the less academically prepared students. We also want to look at things like, did our um, self-regulated learning tools support students who are first-generation students? Really, those subgroups that instructors ask us about all of the time, we want to be able to answer those specific questions. Then, in the fall of 2019, we replicated that study with a more representative sample of instructors. Again, like I said, those who are less tolerant of technology, who um, you know are more skeptical about whether technology could support students in the classroom. And we were able to replicate the results that we had found the semester before. And then, as I said, this semester, we um, have 51 instructors who are participating in a study where they are either using Achieve in one section and not in another section, or they have partnered with an instructor in their department who is teaching the same course. And we are looking at the perceptions and um, the student perceptions and the learning outcomes, comparing them between those two groups. We've just recently passed the midterm of the um, semester, and with the early midterm perception results, we're finding that instructors who are using Achieve feel that um, that tool supports mastery of learning more, supports student engagement and active learning more than other tools that are being used, which are really exciting directional findings, but it won't be until the end of this semester that we'll really be able to fill in the rest of those dots and be able to hopefully make those claims about the impact of Achieve within discipline and within um, implementation patterns, educational contexts. And then quickly, I'll just say, Michael, that in an effort to communicate these findings in a way that is rigorous but also reliable, we have three um, outlets in which, with which we use to communicate the results. 
The first are the technical reports that um, Michael and Thanos are really familiar with because these are the really large comprehensive reports that we ask our Impact Research Advisory Council to review and they use a rubric to rate the study and rate the report and rate the claims that we're making and provide us feedback on each of the areas that we ask them to evaluate of the report. If we haven't reached a three, which is the highest rating, we provide we ask for feedback on how we can get to a three, and the team sort of revises it as you would do a revise and resubmit for a journal publication, for example. And we work to make sure that we feel that though that the Impact Research Advisory Council feels that those technical reports are ready for Macmillan Learning publications. That allows us to get peer-reviewed information in the hands of administrators and educators more quickly than it would if we went through the whole journal um, acceptance process. And in that way, giving them, them the information they need before they make important decisions like adoption and implementation. Then a step down from that are the research reports. These are derived from the peer-reviewed analyses. So these reports aren't all peer-reviewed, but they are derived from what we did in the large technical reports, just disaggregated by different disciplines. For example, what you're seeing here is the calculus report um, that has been disaggregated from the larger report across five disciplines. But it's a specific research focus or a specific discipline focus. Some of our research reports focus, like I said, on first generation students or on closing the academic gap between more and less academically prepared students. And then lastly, our educator studies. These are brief four page studies that are representative of one partnership with one of the instructors in our more comprehensive sample of 60 or so instructors. These really focus on the context, the educational context of that instructor, the challenges she was facing, what she was trying to accomplish in her classroom, how she chose to implement, achieve the specific implementation pattern, um, then the outcomes that were realized in that class specifically. And then these highlight a box which we call insights for educators because we want an educator who can pick up this educator study and say, you know what, I teach Calc 1 in a large four-year classroom. Um, I wanna understand what some of the implications were from this study. And it provides um, suggestions for different ways of implementation. Um, it also provides the feedback that instructor gave to Macmillan to optimize the tool. You know, like I said, we wanna be really transparent. And we speak to whether that feedback has been implemented and achieved since the study took place. So that we're clear that, you know, in the age of agile, these tools are always in development and we're never done building achieve. We're continually going to be optimizing based on the feedback that we're getting from instructors. So these are the three ways that we try to appeal to anyone who wants to understand the research, regardless of sort of their level of understanding of the technical detail or if they're more interested in sort of the specific implementation in that context. So Michael, did that help sort of give a high level view of how we approach it and communicate it as it relates to Achieve? Absolutely, and it brings up a, a critical point that's central to um, the whole premise of standard of proof uh, webinar series, which is um, that um, you should, as you evaluate different products from different vendors, uh, in the context of what you want to do with your students, you should be able to make informed decisions based on a variety of kinds of information um, and formats of information that the vendor makes available to you. If this were a conventional one-hour webinar on Achieves Research, we would have spent the whole hour talking about the charts and graphs that uh, Kara just gestured to in the last five minutes. And, and it's important to spend every, every moment you can and every channel you can talking about the evidence. But it's also important to know that most folks don't have an hour to spend on a webinar going through all of that. So um, we need um, our own sources of information where we can evaluate um, whether the vendor is doing a good job for us. Um, and hopefully what, what Kara's just given you now is the place that you go next information sources that you go to next. And what we've given you in the last hour is a sense of how to read those information sources. Standard of proof is, is about um, showing for you um, just how much work there is involved um, in doing the job right of being uh, a supportive evidence-based vendor um, 
who works collaboratively with educators um, and modeling the conversations that you can have with the vendors and the questions that you're, you're, uh, you can and should be asking in order to determine whether these are vendors um, that are doing the right thing and therefore ones that you should privilege in your um, selection process. Um, so that was a perfect way to wrap up. We could easily spend another hour or two digging into these topics, um, but I, I hope you all have gotten a, a good sense of what Macmillan is trying to, uh, pardon the pun, but achieve here. Um, uh, you will be receiving a follow-up email um, with a link to the archive of this video, of this um, webinar, so you can share it to your colleagues. It will be up on YouTube. It's not going to be uh, behind any kind of pay registration uh, wall because we believe uh, uh, in, um, in, in these webinars as contributions to the community in and of themselves. Um, if, if you registered uh, through the Macmillan website, you will not be getting spam from eLiterate about future webinars unless you opt in. So we will be following up with you if you're interested um, in future uh, webinars um, uh, from Standard of Proof in how you can choose to actively opt in, which we um, have discussed, touched on several times today that, that informed, active informed consent is important. Um, I will uh, briefly put in a shameless plug that we have another webinar uh, at this time next week with Titan Partners on what they've learned in their study about um, uh, um, how campuses need to collaborate across departments in order to improve uh, student success. Um, so um, hope to see you there. I'm happy to see you here. Happy to have had a, an opportunity to speak with our great panelists today um, and to highlight some of the great work that I've been privileged uh, uh, to uh, watch unfold at Macmillan. Uh, thank you all and, and stay healthy. Thank you for the opportunity, Michael. Thank you. Thanks.